morning, everyone. Oh, it's so nice to be here. Um, my name is Stuart, and uh, Kath and I were meant to be here together a few weeks ago, um, and, uh, and, and I was ill and wasn't able to get here. In fact, we've, we've worked in ministry together for years and years, and I was just thinking it's probably the shortest notice we've ever had to bail each other out of anything. It was about literally 10 minutes before I was due to leave to come here. I just felt absolutely awful. And uh, so I'm really grateful that Catherine stepped in to preach that morning. I'm glad it was you. I think you'd cope with the off-the-cuff, no preparation of preaching better than I would. That's really good. So um, I was thinking sometimes, especially when I'm somewhere new, I'd like to tell a bit of a joke to start with, um, just to break the ice. And uh, I was thinking, I was thinking about runners today. I was thinking about a joke that uh, our daughter told us a while ago, and she was telling us that there was a runner in the Rocky Mountains on the trails in America, and uh, the run on, she was, this guy was running on his own, and he kind of became conscious that he was being followed, you know, like sometimes you are, someone behind you, and he said, I turned around and he saw there was a bear following him, so he started to panic and run, and, uh, and as he ran, he was praying Lord, please make this bear a Christian bear, right? And uh, he was so distracted about his prayer that he fell over a log on the path and was down on his face. And he just became conscious that the bear was right on top of him. But he kind of looked around and the bear had its hands like this, like it was praying. And he's like, oh, relief. And the bear said, for this food that we're about to receive, Lord, we're really thankful. <laughs> okay, let's go. So we're, we're, looking, we're looking today in John chapter 10, verses 11 through to 18. And, uh, and here, Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And uh, I think this talk is probably the fourth or fifth in your series on the I am sayings of Jesus. So You'll be familiar now that this, this whole phrase, I am, is really significant because Jesus is making a clear connection to the way in which God himself describes himself to Moses at the burning bush. In Exodus chapter 3, uh, God describes himself as the God who is the I am. In other words, God who always has been, is now, and always will be the one true God. That's who he is. He's the one true God, the only one who always has been is and always will be. And uh, he said, he describes to Moses, this is who I am. And then he sort of describes in a whole range of different ways his character. And I suppose these I am statements of Jesus is Jesus saying, I am God. I am the God who introduced himself to Moses. But also I am the God of the Old Testament who, who not only appeared to Moses, but also is the God who led the Israelites from slavery in Egypt through the wilderness and into the promised land. Fire by night and cloud by day. I am the God who led you. So in other words, as Catherine was preaching, I am the light of the world. I am the same God who led the people of Israel. I am I'm the God who fed the Israelites 40 days, 40 years in the wilderness with manna from heaven, water from the rock miraculously so jesus says i am the bread of life yeah i am the same god i am the living water says jesus the god who provides beautiful and uh and in this passage today jesus describes himself as the good shepherd the good shepherd remember he teaches elsewhere there's none good but god so Jesus is describing himself as the divine shepherd of God who has come into the world. Just like King David experienced God as a good shepherd. You know, in that really famous Psalm 23 in the Old Testament where J uh, King David says, The Lord is my shepherd. Whom shall I want? I lack nothing. He leads me and protects me. Okay, let's dive into our passage today. I'll read the verses as we talk through them. Um, through this morning. Hopefully they'll appear on the screen. Let's read from verse 11 through to 13. First of all, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. 
Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. And in this passage here, in John 10, Jesus describes himself as a shepherd who looks after a flock of sheep. That's how he's describing himself here. And that's a familiar image that would have been really familiar. They would have seen shepherds leading flocks of sheep all over the countryside um, where they lived. It's not so much a familiar image for us today, although as I always think about this, when we took our son Harry here to university, down in Aberystwyth in Wales, we literally drove into the town and the first set of traffic lights we came to, there was a car, I think it was like an old Renault Clio, back seat taken out and sitting beside us at the traffic lights, the, in the, the, the back window was down, there was a sheep looking at the back window. You, know, you don't often see that in Warrington, but you do in Aberystwyth. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. And I think a couple of weeks ago when you looked at uh, the first part of John chapter 10 where Jesus describes himself as the gate for the sheep, you will have thought about he, is a, he who is a shepherd who calls the sheep by name, right? Who leads them personally, who cares for them and leads them to pasture every day. It's beautiful, great picture. Uh, but here, Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. That's his focus right here in this passage. That's what we're going to be focusing on. And he'll repeat that phrase, I am the shepherd who lays down my life for the sheep. He'll repeat that three times through this very short passage. So it's clearly a big issue. And it'll be, in a sense, it'll be like the defining, the thing that defines him as a shepherd more than anything else is that he's the shepherd that's prepared to lay, lay down his life for the sheep. It's a great thing. He cares, he cares so much for his sheep that when danger approaches, like the wolf in this picture here, that uh, rather than run and scarper, he's the shepherd who's prepared to face that danger for the sake of protecting his sheep. That's what he's like. That's what the kind of shepherd he is. He compares himself to the hired hand by contrast, who doesn't care for the sheep because these sheep aren't his sheep. They don't, he doesn't own these sheep. They don't belong to him. He's simply paid to do a job, right? So when danger comes, it says he doesn't give a second thought for the sheep. He'd be gone at the first sight of the wolf approaching because he's only interested in looking after himself. Jesus describes his love as brave, unflinching, sacrificial, he cares for the safety and life of his sheep, even above the safety and life of himself. That's what kind of shepherd he is, right? That's great. This is good news. Now, why does Jesus do this? Why does Jesus care so much for sheep like you and me, frankly? Why does he care so much? Well, it, this passage reveals that he cares so much because these sheep are his. They belong to him. Unlike the hired hand, who's simply paid to do a job looking after someone else's sheep. These sheep belong to him. Yeah? And you know that makes a huge difference in terms of how you feel about your care and your responsibility. You know, like, you can just think if, it, if it's your own kids or members of your own family, right? The level of care and how you feel when they're in danger is just escalated no end. You know, there's a few times where our kids, Harry and Helena, when they were little, you know, got lost or lost in a supermarket or lost in B&Q and stuff like this. And your heart just, it's unbelievable how you feel. And literally you would do anything, you would do anything to make sure that they were safe and protected, right? That's how you feel because they belong to you. They are yours. They're part of your flesh and blood. And that's a great thing. One time Helena, our daughter, got lost in a supermarket. And we were panicking like crazy searching all over and she was little tiny probably only very small and we eventually find her in a photo booth with the, the curtain drawn and she was sat on the chair but her legs were so tiny that you couldn't actually see her feet under the under the under the curtain now it makes sense that Jesus describes himself in this way because if these sheep are his sheep he will go to any length right to protect them 
even to giving up his own life to protect them. That's what kind of shepherd he is in comparison to the hired hand. You know, in Psalm 139, it's a beautiful verse that we often talk about in our church family, that each of us is made in God's image. We're precious to him. We're made in the image of God. So each of us, in a sense, we belong to God. So when Jesus comes and he looks on the face of strangers who've never met him before, they're not actually strangers to him. They're people who's been made in his image and he is their maker and creator. He loves them as those who belong to him. It's a beautiful thing. And uh, that's, what you're, that's what our good shepherd is like. That's why when David is thinking about God as his shepherd in Psalm 23, he says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Why? Because I know that you will be with me every step of the way. And as Christians, we turn to that Psalm so often because we know it to be true and such a great encouragement to us, even as we walk through the darkest valley, even sometimes through the valley of the shadow of death. We take comfort from the fact that we know that God will be with us because he cares that much about us, that he will never leave or abandon us. Proverbs 18 verse 24 says, one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother who will never leave you and never abandon you because you're his. And this is what the good shepherd is like. This is a shepherd that you can trust with your soul and with your life and with your family. And that's our, that's our testimony as a family. You know, we have learned to know and trust the good shepherd. We've learned to trust his love. There's no love like the good shepherd's love. We've learned to trust his commitment to us, that he will never leave us or forsake us that it won't only be good for our life, but it'll be good for our kids' life and for our family's life and for our church family's life. And we're convinced that we can trust the good shepherd. Amen? Do you guys do amen to you? Okay, amen. Okay. And so David says, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the commitment of your good shepherd and mine. We want to say thank you, Lord, right? Thank you, Lord. We can trust him with our hearts as well. Peter says, cast all your anxiety on him. And we've got lots of anxieties. But cast all your anxiety on him because you can trust him, because he cares for you. He's that kind of shepherd. Now, there's a bit of a kicker in this passage. And the reason that Jesus speaks about the good shepherd in the way that he does is not only to emphasize his goodness and his divine character, but also it's by way of contrast to the shepherds who were the religious leaders of Israel for generation after generation after generation, and even in his own generation when he came, who had often been bad shepherds of God's flock and in a sense gave God a bad name by, by, by reflection. And Jesus says, I'm not like them. I'm not those kind of shepherds who acted more like hired hands than they did shepherds of God's flock. I am the good shepherd. So he sets up this amazing contrast. You read about it in uh, Ezekiel. You read about it all over scripture, actually, but I'm just going to choose some passage. A passage here from Ezekiel 34 in the Old Testament, where it's speaking about these, uh, uh, these people who were given responsibility by God to shepherd God's flock, given a care of duty and responsibility. And, uh, uh, and they messed up very badly often. And... Uh, in Ezekiel 34, verse 2, the Lord says through Ezekiel to his people, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. My sheep were scattered because there was no shepherd. They wandered all over the mountains. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. These were bad shepherds who were acting more like the hired hands than they were like the shepherds of God, right? They didn't lead or protect the flock. And when they wandered or got lost, they didn't go after them. The shepherds cared nothing for the sheep. In fact, they were only interested in themselves. And that reflected very badly on God. 
And so Ezekiel 34, verse 11, the Lord says this, for this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself, now listen to this, I myself will search for my sheep. I'm going to do it personally. I'm going to do it properly. I look after them. As the shepherd looks after his scattered flocks, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from the places where they are scattered. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. So when Jesus comes and he describes himself as the good or the godly shepherd, for people who are familiar with these passages and familiar with Psalm 70, 20, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, you know exactly what Jesus is saying. He's saying he's coming as the fulfillment of God's promise. He's going to be the one, the Lord himself, who will come to shepherd his sheep properly, right? He will do it personally. And of course, often at Christmas time, we read Micah chapter 5, uh, verse 6 says, But you, Bethlehem, little village, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And that's exactly what Jesus is and does. He came as the ruler who will lead his people to shepherd the people of Israel and the nations. So in verse 16 of this passage here, the Lord says, I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. That's why Jesus tells stories when he describes what he's like and what God is like. That's why he says, you know, there's a shepherd who has a hundred sheep this is what God is like. But one of those sheep has wandered and is lost now. So what does this shepherd do? This shepherd leaves the 99 in safety and goes after the one who is lost because that's what this shepherd is like. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And if you feel lost or like you've wandered, and we all do from time to time, right? then know this, that this shepherd, the good shepherd, has not forgotten you, has not abandoned you. You've got a good shepherd who's looking for you, that you might be restored. That's good news, right? It's good news to know that about our shepherd, because that's a shepherd that we can trust. Thank you, Lord. He says, I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. Most often in farms where sheep or goats are injured or weak, they are destroyed because actually they're not very valuable. And you'd probably spend more money on vet's bills than you would on actually getting rid of that sheep. And sometimes we might actually feel, does God feel like that about me? Well, the good news is, no, he doesn't. <laughs> this is a shepherd who not only will seek after the lost, but if they're injured or wearied or wrecked, he will bind them up until they're better. That's good news, right? That's God's attitude towards his sheep. He cares for his sheep through thick and thin. He will not abandon us. Isaiah 42, familiar passage, a bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. That's why Jesus... And one of the most famous things he says to people, he says this, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest because that's the kind of shepherd that I am. That's great. This is a shepherd that we can trust. Yeah. That's why the ordinary people were drawn to Jesus and the religious leaders were totally freaked out by him because he carried an authority and a power even over evil spirits, which was clearly divine. And he led them in an entirely different way, which was not self-seeking and selfish, but was selfless and sought to bless the flock with everything that he was and did. Jesus says, um, John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father. Yeah, there's a real connection between the shepherd and his sheep. He knows them, and they recognize that he is different, powerful, authoritative, 
They don't recognize it often perfectly or even accurately. It takes a while for the lights to go on. But they can see, very often we read, for example, Mark 1, Jesus went into the synagogue, began to preach. The people were amazed at his teaching. Why? Because he taught them as one who had authority, unlike the teachers of the law. He was different. He taught with authority. Even the evil spirits obeyed him. There's a real connection there between Jesus and his flock. And uh, when our eyes are opened to see the beauty and the majesty of our shepherd, we bow down. And we want to follow him, right? Because he's worth following. And uh, that passage that we were just kind of mentioned in our worship there about the, the woman at the well, it just reminded me. You know, Jesus not only spoke to her about living water, but she, he spoke into her life in a way that really touched her, in a way that only God could. And when she told her friends, when she went back home to the village in Samaria, her testimony was, I've met someone who can tell, who knows everything about me, has told me everything about me. He knows me. And our shepherd knows us, knows us better than we know ourselves, better than our families even know us. And the amazing thing is, I know what I'm like. And sometimes I don't impress me at all. So if it was down to me impressing God to be acceptable to him, that would be difficult, <laughs> impossible. But God knows us and yet he loves us. That's why it says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Thank you, Lord. Amen. That's great. So Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the, the father knows me and I know the father. Verse 15. And then he reminds us again, in case we've forgotten, here's the distinctive feature of this shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. Yeah. Why does he have to do that? What does he mean? What is that all about? Well, let's just finish with that. Jesus we're told really succinctly by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 that Jesus became a sin offering for us. He offered his life. He gave his life as a sacrifice in substitution for us. Because in reality, we are not able to live up to the standards of God's law. In fact, God's law just exposes our sinfulness and we even get to see ourselves and not capable of living up to God's standards. But Jesus came to give his life to do, what, to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He exchanged his perfection for our sinfulness. No one else but God's sinless, holy son could do this for all of us. And he chose to. Isaiah 52 uh, teaches us that... Uh, Jesus, the Messiah, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. I'll just think about that for a second. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. It says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was pierced for our transgressions. And by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And that's good news, right? That's good news for sinners like you and me. That's good news for those who recognize that we can never achieve in our own strength or ability the standards of God's law, but that we always fall short. And we need a rescuer, a savior, a deliverer. And Jesus voluntarily chose to come his and, and gave his perfection for our sinfulness that we might receive the righteousness of God. That we might stand in a right relationship with God now and forevermore. You know, and Romans 8 verse 1 leaves us in no doubt that those who are in Christ, there is no condemnation. Not now, not ever. 
In fact, God doesn't want us if we're in Christ Jesus. I did that because we speak for a whole lot longer in our church back home. <laughs> so I've just put that timer on to shut me up. That's the, that's the two-minute warning. And we want to say, um, thank you, Lord, for doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. For not only coming as our shepherd and our leader and our guide, but he came as the Lamb of God and offered himself on the cross. And you see that beautiful, can you see it? That beautiful picture there, that's actually a picture from my hometown, well, in Glasgow, in the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery. It's a Salvador Dali um, painting which they bought, and the council bought in 1952 for 8,500 pounds. It's less valuation, it's worth 60 million pounds, so it's a good investment for them. But it's a beautiful picture because, and one of the interesting things about it is that you'll notice if you look closely, and I've looked at that painting for years and years and years at the end of a, a corridor in the, in the art gallery, um, there are no nails on Jesus' hands and feet, which is unusual, and it makes you ask, why is that? Why has he chosen to do it like that? And the reason is that um, more than being an execution where nails held Jesus to the cross, the point that Salvador Dali was making is that love held Jesus to the cross. You know, it says in our passage, verse 18, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Yeah, that's love. This is voluntary. This is the love of the good shepherd for you and for me. This is what love looks like. The love of God, our good shepherd. And this is a shepherd that we can trust. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Catherine's going to lead us in communion just now. Thank you.